As we reported on Bridge City News, the Emergencies Act passed on Monday. Now, what does that mean for Canada and for Canadians? To talk about this in a little more detail is political reporter Brian Lilly joining us once again from Toronto. Brian, Conservative MPs and even Alberta Premier Jason Kenney say the Emergencies Act is not necessary considering that the borders are no longer closed, most of the Freedom Convoys left our nation's capital, so why still move forward with it? Well, the Trudeau Liberals, uh, I don't think, had a, a valid reason for bringing it in. I thought that the way the law is written, they could bring it in, but I, I didn't think they should. I didn't think that uh, it was needed at all. And we saw with the way the protest was cleared out by police in Ottawa that they just used existing laws, standard police procedures. You know, there was no special magic sauce that the Emergencies Act gave them. Uh, the Windsor border crossing for the Ambassador Bridge, which the Trudeau Liberals kept bringing up in the House of Commons to defend using the Emergencies Act. Well, I mean, my goodness, that was uh, cleared and opened the day before they invoked the Emergencies Act. So they didn't really need it. They, they cited the ability to uh, commandeer tow trucks and force them to tow rigs out of the way. Well, you know, once the road was clear, tow truck operators were willing to do it. Plus, they could have used either tow trucks that the military has uh, at CFP Petawawa, just a short drive from Ottawa. They could have used the ones that Ottawa's municipal transit system, OC Transpo, has. They didn't do that. Uh, the Emergencies Act is supposed to be there for when you have no other choice. And I think they had lots of other choices. They just decided not to go that route because the Emergencies Act seems dramatic. It makes it look like the federal government is doing something. And Justin Trudeau gets to go in and be the hero firefighter putting out the flames that he was fanning just days before. Some people think this is just simply a power grab by the Trudeau Liberals. Interim Conservative leader Candace Bergen tabled a motion to revoke the powers immediately after the vote was over, Brian. Why would you do that so soon after losing the vote? It, well, it, it would seem odd if, uh, you know, you're not familiar with the act and very few of us are, but I've spent a lot of time reading it lately. By invoking what's called Section 59, so last night on, on Monday, they voted on Section 58. Section 58 is them um, giving credence to the government. They say, yes, you have shown us why you need this act and we vote to continue the act. Section 59 says that any 10 senators or 20 members of the House of Commons can sign a letter calling for a vote to rescind. The House of Commons was not supposed to be sitting yesterday. It was a special sitting. They come back next Monday. By tabling that motion immediately, what Candace Bergen has done has put this, this coming vote on the order paper for next week. So as of next Monday, they have to start having 10 hours of debate and then a vote on whether or not to keep these measures in place. The vote on Monday night extended them for 30 days from when they were invoked. So it was invoked March, uh, February 14th. So about March 16th is when they would expire unless the government withdraws and says we no longer need them or they have a vote. If Trudeau wants to keep them until March 30th, he's going to have to go through another vote now forced by Candace Bergen and the Conservatives. So I think it was a very smart move. I don't, I, I don't think they needed to bring in the act. I don't think they needed to extend the powers on Monday. They will have a very hard time explaining why they need the Emergencies Act when a vote happens again next week, probably around March 2nd. Yeah, the motion was passed in the House of Commons, but it still has to be voted on by the Senate. Will it just simply be rubber stamped? I really don't see the Senate doing anything other than what the government wants it to do. Uh, one, it would be odd for on such an important measure for the appointed body to overturn the will of the elected body. So like what the elected body did or not, that is the will of the elected body of parliament to have the appointed body turn around and say, no, you can't have that. That would be, mm, a, it would be the wrong thing for them to do. Beyond that, the so-called independent Senate group votes more often with the Trudeau Liberals than the old Liberal caucus did when they still had Liberals in uh, or Senators in the Liberal caucus. So there's no way that this supposedly independent body is going to do anything other than rubber stamp the Prime Minister's wishes. So Brian, let me ask you something. A lot of us here in the West are concerned of government overreach. What will the Emergencies Act really mean for Canadians? Well, if you own a tow truck company in Ottawa, it means they're going to try and force you to tow trucks. Oh, wait, they're, they're gone already. The trucks are gone. Uh, look, the, there definitely is 
overreach in this. And, uh, you know, the government keeps saying no civil liberties have been suspended or infringed. That's not true. Uh, you know, some media outlets have said that all civil liberties have been uh, suspended in Canada. That's not accurate either. But, you know, in the short term, they have brought in measures to say you can't go certain places. You could not. On the day that Parliament was voting on the Emergencies Act, you were not allowed to go down there and protest that. You know, no, not as part of the convoy, not to reconstitute the Freedom Convoy. You showed up yourself with a placard. And how many times did you see that working on Parliament Hill, Hal? One lonely person with a placard outside of the Commons. That was not allowed. So that is an infringement of charter rights. But the big thing and the very scary thing is the weaponization of the banking system uh, in terms of saying, you know, we need this act so that we can go after your money. Uh, look, the, the first government to freeze the, the assets of the, the, the convoy was the Ford government in Ontario. They invoked Section 490.8 uh, of the Criminal Code of Canada which froze the money. It didn't seize it, but it did freeze it until a, a you know, proper court hearing could be held. They could have done that, but the Trudeau Liberals want to go after the bank accounts of individuals involved, not just the organizers, but individuals. And I know that they say that it is not going to be used widely. Doesn't matter. They have given themselves that power. And we know of 206 bank accounts frozen so far, I say that goes well and above the organizers when you get to 206, and we know that it's going to grow. That should be a concern for everybody because you might agree with it right now, but you know, you, you love Justin Trudeau and you hated the convoy. Well, what about the next time when there's a conservative government and it's a, a, an indigenous and environmental groups protesting a pipeline? Will you support them in using that? Because this has now become normalized in terms of going after the bank accounts of individual protesters. That's wrong, Hal. Deputy Prime Minister Christian Freeland says she wants to make some of these emergency powers permanent. Now, which power specifically are we talking about here? And it sounds like we might be headed down a very dangerous path, Brian. Well, I'm going to be watching to see if they do head down a dangerous path. I'm, you know, always a big fan of Reagan's old line of trust, but verify from the Cold War era. And what they have said so far in terms of what they want to make permanent is actually understandable. And that is adding crowdfunding and cryptocurrencies into the FinTrack system. Now, FinTrack is the system that watches for um, organized crime moving money around or terrorist groups moving large sums of money around. It's been in place for over 20 years now or about that long, and it, it makes sense. You know, you don't want people being able to move large sums of money without setting off a tripwire where, um, you know, it, you're suddenly sending $100,000 somewhere. Do you have a reason for doing that? Okay, yeah, Hal always sends $100,000 to his son every Friday because Hal has $100,000 every Friday. If you're doing that all the time, no big deal. It, it's part of a, a normal pattern. But when they see unusual activity, FinTrack is there to monitor it and alert police and let them look into it. The fact that cryptocurrency wasn't yet in the FinTrack system is actually shocking to me. And the fact that crowdfunding sites were not part of that system is also shocking. These are two loopholes that organized crime and terrorist groups could have been using for the last several years and we wouldn't know. And I believe both have been used for money laundering operations in, in you know, which Canada is awash in money laundering. We need to get on top of that. If that's all they do, then I'm fine with that. My worry is they'll go further. They'll try to extend things that they shouldn't. Brian, one of the organizers of the Freedom Convoy, Tamara Lich, was denied bail and will be back in court on March the 2nd. But why was she denied bail? It, it was a strange uh, reasoning uh, that I read from the judge. If the judge had come out and said, well, we're denying you bail because we think you're a flight risk, I think that would have been completely understandable. Uh, just because of what Ms. Lich has said, the fact that her husband said he got to Ottawa on a private plane, but you know, wouldn't tell anybody how you know whose plane or who paid for it or things like that. That, you know, if you're worried about someone fleeing town and they have access to a private plane from an unnamed person, as a judge, you might be worried that they'll flee town, they'll flee the country. But the judge in this case didn't use the flight risk, at least as far as the reporting I saw. It was all about the fear that she would reoffend. How I live in a city that has a 
a gang and gun problem where people that shoot up the streets are given bail the next day. I have covered protests like the Somebody of the Americas in Quebec City years ago, uh, the G20 here in Toronto about a decade ago, where violent acts, in, in Quebec City, it was a pitched battle for two, three days. Uh, in uh, the G20 here in Toronto, uh, on, on, I think it was a Friday, there were large parts of the city that were no-go zones for anybody that was worried about their safety as protesters marauded, burnt, uh, uh, set up bonfires in the middle of busy intersections, trashed cop cars, trashed businesses. And in that case, one of the main organizers was granted bail the next day. So I'm not sure why Ms. Uh, Lich was denied bail on the worry of reoffending. As I said, if it was a flight risk, given the way her husband wouldn't answer questions, he wanted to be her surety, but wouldn't answer basic questions about him flying to Ottawa on somebody's private plane, that's understandable. I don't get the judge's reasoning in this case, though. Last week, there was an attack on the coastal gasoline pipeline project in northern BC. Now, so far, no major moves by Ottawa. They're leaving things up to the police. Now, don't the same arguments used for the Emergencies Act apply here as well? 100% they apply. Uh, the government has said that they needed the Emergencies Act to, uh, because of the economic harm being caused to, uh, to the Canadian economy, that uh, trade was being disrupted, that critical infrastructure was at risk, that, that they claimed violence that, quite frankly, wasn't there, not on the scale of what they were talking about. Yeah, people were harassed in the streets. Yes, there were isolated incidents, but it wasn't the, the mass protest doing this. In this case, we're talking about activists who went into a work camp caused millions of dollars in damage. This was a politically motivated attack. They set things on fire. They destroyed pieces of heavy equipment. They booby-trapped the road to stop the police from being, and, and other first responders, from being able to access it. How you don't turn around and, and say all the same arguments apply is beyond me. And that's one of the reasons that I didn't think the power should be extended. It's one of the reasons I don't think the Emergency Act should have been used in this way. See. What people have to remember, whether we're talking Provincial Emergencies Act or federal, you can invoke the act, and that's fine. Uh, and here in Ontario, they invoke the Emergencies Act. But what's important are the orders that flow from them. And the Ontario orders were all about clearing roads and bridges. Four pages detailing how and why that should be done. That is pretty normal. Governments of all stripes want the roads and bridges clear. In the federal case, the orders talk about the, the banking information, uh, restricting freedoms. That's the scary part. And if it applied in the case of the Freedom Convoy, it surely must apply in this case in Houston, BC. But they're not doing it. And with that, they're showing how political they're willing to be, politicizing the Emergencies Act and the use of force by police and the use of the banking system by the government. The federal Conservatives have not yet moved forward with the rules for their leadership campaign, but there is talk of another candidate joining Pierre Polyev. Former Quebec Premier Jean Charest is thinking about running. Tell me more. Well, uh, this comes from uh, Joël Denis Bellevance, great reporter with La Presse, former colleague on the Hill, who uh, says Charest has gone beyond just taking calls or you know, hearing from people that uh, are interested. He's actively looking at it. Now, the rules are important. You set up, you know, the rules haven't been set. Once the rules are set, that will tell people whether they want to enter or not, because the feeling right now is Pierre Polyev has the upper hand. He announced early. He's got a lot of uh, uh, support from MPs in the Conservative caucus. If the rules come out and they say, well, it's going to be a two-month leadership campaign and you got to have all your memberships in within a month, well, then don't expect to see a lot of people enter because they won't have the ability to organize. If it's a longer campaign, then yeah, Charest's most likely going to be in. You could see others deciding to jump. I know that uh, Patrick Brown, the former Ontario PC leader, uh, currently mayor of Brampton and a one-time federal MP, he's looking at running, um, but it depends on the rules. Will he have time to be able to sell memberships and organize? Will people from different factions be able to, to, to court support? If it's a longer campaign, expect more candidates. If it's a shorter campaign, it favors Pierre Polyev. But Jean Charest, definitely looking at, at doing it. For people that say, well, he was a liberal in Quebec. When Jean Charest was uh, leader of the Progressive Conservative Party federally in the late 90s, 
he was asked to go and join uh, or to uh, run to be premier of Quebec. At that point, there was no Quebec Conservative Party. There were two parties. One was Federalist. That was the Liberals. The other was the Party Quebecois. They were the Separatists. It was a weird amalgamation of people that you would find in this party. Everyone from New Democrats like Tom Mulcair to conservatives like Jean Charest, all running under the liberal banner because that was the only party running to keep Quebec in uh, in confederation. He did run a, a pretty left wing government, but that's Quebec. He is more conservative than people will give him credit for. And I know that from years of covering him, both when he was premier and when he was opposition leader in Quebec. Political reporter and Toronto Sun columnist Brian Lilly, thanks for your time today. Thank you, Hal.